So this video will be a use case on Docker for the Oracle database server. Now we'll go through enough Docker commands to feel comfortable using a container. And in this case, of course, it's gonna be Oracle's database server container and just enough Oracle administration so that we can create a schema and load data so that we have a database that we can experiment with. In particular, we're gonna spin up an Oracle database server in a Docker container. We're gonna log into it and examine it. We'll create a schema, the DVD rental um, that was made popular by MySQL initially, but it's an open source database with data. And we're gonna set up our local environment, meaning our host, so that we can do development in our local environment. The container is considered to be the remote environment and your host or local machine is considered to be the local environment. We'll install the Oracle client libraries and SQL Plus, show how to do the connect string for SQL Plus, how you connect with the beautiful SQL IDE dBeaver uh, community edition, and also how to connect uh, what the connection string is with the CX Oracle DB API implementation. Oftentimes, one of the stumbling points in getting started is how to connect, and that's why these various connection strings and connection methodologies are going to be shown. The requirements are if you're on Windows 10, well, you, you need to have WSL2 installed, Docker Desktop for Windows installed, and the Windows Terminal app is nice to have. I'll be using that in this video. In terms of the version for Windows, it should be the May 2020 build, which is sometimes called version 2004. Also, it's now being called version 20H1. Or later, it could be the 20H2 that it will come out around Halloween of 2020. Winver.exe will show you the version. For Linux, the instructions are quite straightforward um, because Docker was initially created under Linux. So you can install it, for example, in the Ubuntu distribution or another distribution. If you go up uh, from this directory, you can find the other distributions. And you should do the post install instructions under Linux because that'll allow you to use Docker without ha having to do a sudo command. And that's simply by adding the group Docker to the user that's running the command and you no longer need to do sudo. And of course, you don't use, need to use sudo under Windows either if you're using Docker. So we're going to go on Docker Hub and we're going to find the Oracle database server. So let's actually go ahead and do that right now. We're on Docker Hub. Let's search for Oracle database. Of course, they've got a couple databases, but the main one we're interested in, we'll just do the search. The Oracle Database Enterprise Edition. That's the version that we want. This is a full-blown Oracle database server. And I want to be able to show that with Docker, you can put this in a Windows 10 home environment, which seems almost impossible, but it actually works. It's pretty cool that you can do this on a Windows 10 home system. And of course, you can do it under Linux as well with Docker, because it's the same. Let's click on this. And now we get a bare minimal explanation here. This doesn't really tell us enough to use it. Um, and there's some reviews. Some of these reviewers did not know how to use the container. I have had problems with the container and I think it actually works pretty well. And resources, but the documentation is the 12CR2 documentation. And really what we need first is the image documentation, uh, the documentation for the image that we're about to download. If you hit proceed to checkout, it makes it seem like you're going to actually pay some money, but no, all you got to do is register with Oracle. They want to keep track of who's downloading their enterprise server in a container. So you'll click this, you do your free registration, and then you get the documentation about the image that we're about to download. So once you've done the registration, you can see this documentation page. Now, it turns out that you can't get back here unless you go back through the registration process again. So I highly recommend bookmarking this page. That way you can come back to it again at a later point in time. This documentation is, is bare minimum. 
um, I'll be going over some of these commands, like starting the Oracle database server, a little bit differently um, in a more practical way. But there's good information here that you wouldn't find necessarily somewhere else. So this is a good starting point. You should read this documentation to understand the basics of the image, and then I'll be adding to this documentation in my video. I've already pulled this down to my machine, but I'll show you the command. So by the way, I just brought up a Windows terminal application, which is a much nicer terminal than the one that comes by default. But this is Windows terminal, it's Windows application. I've got it configured so that it bring, comes up immediately into my WSL2 environment, which is an Ubuntu environment, 20.04. And I've got the Ubuntu colors just to show me that it really is Ubuntu. So that's my home directory under WSL. CD projects, Oracle. And let's go ahead and bring up VS Code, code dot. So we'll bring it up in this particular directory, which again is a WSL2 directory under Windows 10. The first thing I want to do is just pull the uh, image from Docker Hub. Let's uh, bring up a terminal and run this command. Now I've already pulled this database, so and I've also done the registration, so I didn't have to do another Docker login because I've already done that. You might have to do Docker login the first time you do this, or if you go through the interface on the web, you will have logged in already. So my image is up to date. This is a two gigabyte image. Let's actually go ahead and run a couple commands just to show. So we can do, in the new style commands, you use Docker, image ls for example and we can see it's there and it's about two gigabytes and this is the slim version i could also do docker container ls and we see i've got no containers i could also do no containers that are running docker container a that'll show me all the containers that we have had running whether they're running or not and because I went ahead and installed a couple of extensions to VS Code, in particular Docker and Docker Explorer, I get this Docker icon. And that goes ahead. This is the equivalent of an LS on the images. This would be equivalent of LS on the containers, LS-A, I believe. It is LS-A. And I have an icon that shows you whether the container is running or not. And you can see the networks, registries, and volumes. One thing to note here is that um, Docker was installed via Docker Desktop for Windows. And it then go, it automatically creates, it assumes you've got WSL too, and it will do a symbolic link from user bin Docker to the Docker EXE that it installed. So don't apt install Docker or yum install Docker. Docker, um, that's simply not necessary. You should just, you've already got it when you did Docker for Desktop. These are the most common commands, and they're also the simple to learn how to use and to use. So for example, what I just demonstrated how to do an image LS, a container LS, or a volume LS. You would remove them the same way, docker image remove, for example. These are the new style commands. So there are older commands, and most of the videos you see out there when you're trying to learn Docker, the person who's explaining them to you learned the old style, and they'll probably explain that to you. Um, I would recommend if you're just getting started that you go with the new style commands. They're a lot easier to remember. There's an awful lot of command line options. And if they're, this is a structured, organized way of using those commands and it makes it easier to get up and running with. Docker run will run a container. Docker start will start a container if it's already been created. Run will actually run it and create it if it hasn't been created. And it will also pull it from Docker Hub if it hasn't been pulled. Stop will stop a container. Logs will look at uh, the log file that's being produced by your running container or has been produced. And this is to execute a command inside of your container. I'll be going over these uh, in a little more detail in, in a moment. And the Docker, let's go ahead and just uh, Click on this so we can see the commands that we've got here. And the new Docker documentation 
does show you how to do these. Um, so for example, Docker container, and then under Docker container, you see the things like copy, diff, exec, ls. This is the new style of commands, which again, I, I highly recommend. You would see the same thing under Docker image, ls, uh, rm, and other the inspect, which is a nice command sometimes to understand more about the image or the container or the volume or the network. Now I'm gonna go ahead and kick off the container that we have pulled to our uh, system, to our host machine, our local system. So next I wanna do is actually just kick up this container and run it. So this is what the command looks like. This is a backslash so that we can continue onto the next line. This will be run at your command prompt. And what this is doing is creating a container named Oracle DB. It will create or use an existing named volume for Oracle DB. That's where the data is persisted. And when you start this container, the way Oracle is set up, it's, if it doesn't see a database that exists, it will initialize a database from scratch. So the very first time you start up this container, if there, again, if there's no data associated with it, with it yet, it'll take a little bit longer to start up. But thereafter, um, it won't have to reinitialize the database and the startup will be faster. So going over some of the commands that we saw in that previous instruction, dash D runs the container in detached mode. So it's running like a background service process. Publish will map the container's port to the host's port. The primary uh, port that's used on Oracle is 1521. If I publish 1521 to the host, then on localhost, I've got a 1521 port that's actually a Oracle database server. The restart command tells the container what to do if, the, if Oracle were to crash. That's not too likely, but if it did, it would try to restart it. The volume is what maps the containers directory to a named volume on your host machine. When you use named volumes, Docker will manage them for you. So I recommend named volumes. And how did we know that it was slash ORCL was where we, the data is being stored in this particular container? Well, if we go back to our image description on reusing existing database, if you want to reuse the existing database, it gives you an example command, very similar to the one I'm running. Dash V is short for dash dash volume. And it gives you a name, uh, volume, and then slash Oracle. So the data volume is mounted inside the container at slash ORCL. This is the key piece of information that we needed to know so that we would know how to persist that data to the host. And of course, the last command, last part of the command is the actual image that we want to create the container from. And a brief note, an image is like a template or a class in an object-oriented um, terminology. And the container is like an instance of a class. It's the actual thing that is actually running um, when you use Docker Run. You can use docker logs dash f to follow the logs. I'll show that in a moment. And uh, let's go ahead and bring that up. I go over here in VS code, and this is the command. And let's go ahead and run this command. So this is the very first time we just see that the Oracle um, database volume has been created. We see that the container has been created and started. Um, if I right click on this, I can see view logs and it will, let's go to the top command that it ran. It executed for you docker logs dash F and then the container ID. Now we named this container Oracle DB. So we could have also done at the command line docker log stash f oracle db it shows it's setting up it again this initial setup takes a little bit longer because it's initializing the database and uh, it's not quite ready even when it says 
done, it sometimes needs just a few more seconds. So that's it, the container's up and running. Now what can we do with this container? How, how do we access it? Um, well, the first thing we're gonna do here is, well, let's actually show the start and stop command. That's useful to know. Okay, now it really has started up because the database I'm gonna to wanna to be working with is the PDB1 database. And now that that's open, we can actually work with that database. Although the first thing I want to show is just how you can start and stop this container that now exists. So I'm going to do this at the command line just to show how that works. We can do docker container stop oracle db. Again, we, we named it oracle db. That's how we're keeping track of things. And that will return when the container has been stopped. There's a few things that Oracle has to do to clean up. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit larger than most containers, a lot larger, and therefore it takes longer to shut down. And we see that this it's not running. It's in a, a red rectangle here. We can kick it up. Again, now we've created the Oracle DB with the run command, the Oracle DB container. So we can just start it up again and it will automatically reconnect to the volume we gave it in the run command. And we can also go back, of course, and we can look at the logs on this again if we like. This is already up and running, so we're ready to go. Just a couple of seconds. You can also right-click on this and um, attach a shell. I will do that by hand. Sometimes the automatic instruction that gets created for you by um, VS Code is not exactly what you want, but oftentimes it is, so it's worth trying. But it's worth knowing how to do this on your own at the command line. So Docker, and we want to execute a command. We want this to be an, an interactive terminal. We need the name of the container that's running. And then we need to specify what command it is we want to run. So we're going to run bin bash. So this will allow us to actually get inside this running container. And we see that we are in fact at the root directory. Curiously on this particular container, we get logged in as Oracle, which turns out to be helpful actually. And we can take a look at some of the environmental variables that were set up inside of this container. ENV creates a list of environmental variables. Let's just look for the ones that have the word Oracle in them. It set up the, the SID and the home. The home tells you where the applications like SQL Plus actually live. And it should also then be on the path as well, I believe. Yes, we have Oracle Home on the path because uh, with dash slash bin. So Oracle Home slash bin is where the executables live. Okay. So this isn't a class on Oracle administration, but I will demonstrate the minimum that you need to know how to do to be able to connect to it. And it's helpful to understand to see the tnsnames.ora file so that we know how to connect to this particular um, Oracle service, the database server. So I just did a find from the root and the one that we're interested in, a couple of them show up. Um, if you read the documentation, this is called an Oracle CDB database. When I say documentation, I'm referring to the Docker Hub documentation for this image. This is the particular um, one that's actually being used. I can go ahead and do Control Shift C and come down here and do cat space Control Shift V. And the re reason for Control Shift in a Linux terminal is that if you were to do Control C, it would stop whatever's running. But Control Shift C allows you to copy and Control Shift V allows you to paste. So let's go ahead and look at that. And 
again, I'm not explaining very much here. I won't be explaining very much here, but I will sh show you that the service name is this right here. This is necessary in order to connect to the database. You need to know what the service name is here. Now, what Oracle decided to do, which is arguably not the simplest thing that could have been done, is they created what's called a CDB and PDB database. And I'm gonna completely ignore this whole talk, topic of CDB. I'm simply gonna say that the PDB database that was created in the container is the one that we wanna use. And we're just gonna ignore the CDB. The uh, image documentation says that the sys password is aura doc under bar db1. So now we can actually go ahead and connect to this. I'm gonna do it inside the container using SQL plus as system DBA, and we're connecting with the PDB1 because that's the one we're interested in. Go ahead and run that command um, from inside our terminal here. SQL plus, sys, and then the password, at ORCLPDB1 as system DBA. And we see we connected. Now I'd like to just um, double check that we connected to the place that we intended to, because if we inadvertently connect to the CDB database, it's not gonna do what we want. We need to connect to the DB, um, a PDB database. So we can do select star from global name. And we see that we did in fact connect. This is basically our service connection, which is connecting this to PDB. That's the key letters that we're looking for to be sure we're in the right location. And um, select star from global name to verify the database connection as we just did. Now let's just show you one advantage of containers. Let's say we had done something crazy as sys, um, or sysdba. And instead of having to worry about, what well, we just destroyed everything and we got to reinstall Oracle. No, all we got to do is stop the container, remove the container, remove the volume, that's the key step here, um, because the volume is what we messed up if we did something wrong as system DBA, and rerun the command again. Let's just show how easy that actually is. I'm gonna go ahead and exit out of my SQL plus session. I'm still inside the container. Let's go ahead and exit out of the container itself. And um, let's pretend, as I mentioned, that we messed up the, the database completely because we weren't careful with our sysdba privilege. You shouldn't use the sysdba for almost anything so that you don't accidentally make a mistake like that. But uh, if you're just getting started and learning, it can certainly happen. So we can just do docker, stop, Oracle DB. And takes a moment for it to actually stop. And uh, let's bring this back up to the top. Docker, let's remove that container. Dot container remove Oracle DB. It may not, yes it did. Now we can remove the data the, uh, that's persistent data on the host. Docker volume remove Oracle database. And we're ready to start it up again. So that's all you have to do if you make some catastrophic error as system <laughs> administrator. Of course, if you had a database backup, you could restore the backup. But for learning purposes, this is an awful lot easier. And we hadn't even done the uh, data insertion to backup at this point. So go ahead and, and kick it off again. So again, all we did here was stop the container, remove it, remove the volume, and restart everything. And we're back from square one. We're back at square one. I We'll just briefly mention that you could also start this up with Docker Compose. I'm not gonna actually talk about Docker Compose very much. 
other than to say that you need a version to show you what version of Docker Compose this specification is using. And it's actually pretty self-explanatory. Here's the image that's being run. We're going to restart it always. The volume, we're going to map this named volume that's managed by Docker to slash Oracle inside the container. We're going to take the container's 1521 port and map it to our host 1521 port. And the way you, you need to specify that this volume outside of the services here is the volume that you want to be able to, to persist to. And then all we have to do is Docker Compose up or Docker Compose down. Let's come back here. <laughs> of course, I just started this up again, but let's go ahead and stop it. And let's actually just remove it. And um, let's try the Docker Compose. Docker Compose is also installed on when, uh, when you install Docker Desktop for Windows. Under Linux, you have to install Docker Compose separately. By default, um, it uses docker-compose.yml, but you can also specify the file directly. And then you say up. So again, what we're looking at here is this simply another way of saying the same thing um, that we had here. It's just a different format and this allows for a lot more flexibility if you need to start up multiple containers to do your full stack development which has multiple services you put in the multiple services here and it's an easier way to manage the starting and stopping of containers. I'm not explaining much I'm just going to go ahead and run it, pick it up and in this case, it works a little bit differently in that we see these logs coming right to the terminal here. It's already started. We could still also, though, um, view the logs, follow the logs, dash F for follow, so that as the log is being created, we continue to print it out to the terminal. That's what the dash F option does. And it's starting up just as it did before. But it's a little bit easier to bring it up and down um, by just saying Docker Compose up and Docker Compose down. Now it names things slightly differently. It named so the volume we had created previously was Oracle DB. So this is you do have to be careful about. Now the directory this is actually in, if I just do a plus and get a new shell, we're in the project's Oracle directory. So it looks at the directory that it's in, Docker Compose, and prepends that to the name of the volume that we gave it, prepends it to the name of the network that's being created for you automatically as well. So that is an important distinction here. Even though we said use the name volume Oracle DB, it actually kicked up a volume Oracle underbar Oracle DB because I, it's in the directory, its parent directory, or it lives in the directory Oracle. The next step is to install the Oracle client libraries and utilities on the host. Now, why are we doing this? We're doing this because the idea is that their server, the Oracle database server, is in this container, but we want to do as much development as we can on our local machine. That's what our local machine is for. It's, it's for development. So we need client utilities that can log into the server, such as SQL Plus, and uh, if we're using Python, we, we're going to connect to it um, with a connection string using the CX underbar Oracle a module. And without these uh, client libraries, we won't be able to connect with Python or we won't be able to connect with SQL Plus from our host machine. So that's why we're going to install the Oracle client libraries and utilities. Now it's important to note that we're going to install the Linux Oracle client utilities because we're working in a Linux environment. That WSL2 subsystem is a Linux environment. So we're not installing the clients for Windows. We could do that, but we're going to be developing under Linux. So we're going to install the client libraries for Linux. So we can go ahead and Oracle Instant Client, that's the name of it, and the Linux version. Go ahead and get to the page. And we see our version, um, by the way, is much newer here. That's fine. The 
client utilities are backwards compatible with older versions of Oracle. So even though the database server is Oracle 12C, it's fine to run a client that's the latest client. We're gonna go ahead and just download the zip file for the, uh, the basic that gets you all the various um, shared libraries that allow the utilities to work. And I'm also gonna download the zip file for SQL Plus. Now I've already done that before, so I can bring up File Explorer, go into Downloads, and see that I've already got Instant Client Basic Linux and SQL Plus Linux downloaded. Now the instructions for how to use these zip files is at the very bottom of the page, all the way down here. And we're gonna CD into opt Oracle, create it if it doesn't exist, and we're going to unzip each of these. So let's go ahead and do that. Bring up, say, another terminal, CD to slash opt, which would normally be created for you automatically, or is. I've got nothing there. Now this does need to be as root. So we're gonna sudo um, make der Oracle. CD to Oracle. So now the question is, how do we access the Windows file system from the WSL2 file system? So what I've done is I've created a symbolic link um, called win slash downloads. Ellen dash S creates it so that I don't have to remember where Windows, how to access the Windows download directory from my WSL directory. So let's just look at, um, and we're looking for instant. And we see we've got the two zip files right there. So now we wanna unzip these files. So um, again, we wanna do this as root because this is the root permissions here for opt Oracle. This is gonna give us everything for the system sudo unzip and that was in my windows download directory instant client basic i'm hitting tab for uh to expand the file names and it's kind of cool that um, zip will also perform the ln-s for you so that you don't have to run that um, if you don't know what that means that's just what those errors arrows are showing you is a symbolic link of one file to another. Let's go ahead and unzip the other directory. That was called SQL plus. Good. Um, the next step is to install LIBAIO. Now under Ubuntu, it's actually LIBAIO one. And of course you use apt instead of yum under Ubuntu. So I've already installed it, but just to show you what happens if you already have installed it. So that's the instruction you would run. Nothing happened on my machine because I've already done that step. The next thing to do is to set up your load library path and your path. So I've already gone ahead and done that in my dot bash RC, which gets run when your terminal is created. I put on my path opt Oracle instant client. The version that we unzipped, by the way, is 19 under bar eight. So now we can access um, the binary files that exist there. And also on the load library path, well, that shows us where the shared objects, the shared libraries are. Under Windows, um, you would use path for both, I believe, but we're not really under Windows here. We're under the WSL subsystem. So these two need to be set so that it can find the shared libraries that the client utilities use. And of course, it's got to be on the path so that you can find it. Now let's look at what our next step was. Now we've installed the client utilities and we want to go ahead and connect. The first connect string I'm going to show is from SQL plus username password at the 
host, which is localhost in this case, because we mapped the 1521 of the remote container to 1521 on the local host. And this was the service name that we looked up inside of tnsnames.ora. Um, and this is the database we want to connect to. So we'll go ahead and use that connection string. Command I want to run to log in is um, SQL plus, username, password, host, and service name. Now we have to also give it a role when you log in like that or it doesn't work properly. So we just logged in as the system DBA from our client machine. We connected to the container with this particular connect string and we're, in, and we're now at the client. So again, if I do select star from global name, we can see that we're at the PDB1 connection, which is the one that we want for this to work, for this container to work for us. And the next thing we want to do is create a user because we're going to add, which effectively creates a schema of with the same name as the user. And if we can do this, then we know again we're in the right database. If it fails, if you can't add a user, then you could be in the CTB database because that doesn't allow you to add users. We're going to grant these uh, privileges to that particular user, and we'll, we'll be ready to create the schema and load it with data. We'll go ahead and do that now. And the user was created, and then we're going to go ahead and add the permissions. By the way, these weird characters at the end have to do with my um, rec my desktop recorder that I'm using, and that's a particular hotkey that I sometimes use, and it creates these weird characters that I have to get rid of. So just pay no attention to that. Ignore that. Go ahead and grant the privileges that we wanted to. And let's see what the next step is. Okay, there's several um, different GitHub accounts that have this Sakila database. And this is a nice database that was actually open sourced. Sometimes it's called the DVD rental database. It's available for all databases, MySQL, Postgres, Oracle Enterprise. And we wanna go ahead and create this schema and add in the data so that we can just play around with some SQL on our database server container. Here's one location where you can find this. Again, it's open source. So you'll find it in a number of different places. I went ahead and this particular location, although it has the best documentation, that's why I'm using this as an example. It has about 4,000 files that you don't need when you do a clone or a zip. Um, what I've done is after getting the zip file, I went ahead and copied the Sakila subdirectory Oracle, because we're obviously dealing with the Oracle database to a my WSL2 directory. Let's just show how you might do something like that. Um, CD projects Oracle. By the way, if I bring up the Windows File Explorer here, which I can do by uh, doing the .exe at the end, it'll, it'll find it, and I do a dot, it'll bring it up in the current directory. That's the easiest way to bring up File Explorer with the representation of the WSL subsystems file system. And you can see the full name here, WSL dollar off of the network, Ubuntu 2004, home, username, projects, Oracle. So I can bring up another File Explorer and go to my downloads directory. And here is the zip file that I got off of GitHub. You can start to drill down, main, and then examples, then the Sakila database, and then Oracle. So this is what we want. Um, go back up one, actually. I want to copy this, so let's right click and say copy. And I want to paste it in right here. And it did it. Now, one thing we notice, and this happens when you copy from the Windows file system into WSL2, 
is it creates these zone identifier files. These are completely useless. And you can go ahead and delete them and not worry about them anymore. So now what I've done is I, I downloaded the scripts for this to create the schema and to populate the data. And I put them in a subdirectory off our projects directory. And then following our outline, the next thing we need to do is actually run these scripts. So let's go ahead and do that. This was, we created the user as, now we could actually do a connect string from here, but I'm gonna do it from the command line directly. We wanna log in as the user we just created. And that user acts like a schema in Oracle. So now we've logged into the database as that particular user. And we want to execute the SQL scripts. First of all, we want to create the uh, schema. So in order to run the script, we started SQL plus in the project's Oracle directory. The subdirectory off of that that has the scripts is called Oracle Sequila DB. And this is a relative path that we're using from our current directory. And then we need to put in the name of the schema uh, creation script. Go ahead and run that. And we see that it worked. That's nice. <laughs> And what's our next step here? Do the same thing for the insert data. So let's do the same thing with insert data. And go ahead and run the command. I must have had a typo, let's try that again. This is the uh, correct file name. And we see that it's actually inserting data one row at a time. This is a very slow way to load a database. But for a small example database that's been open sourced on the web so that we can use it, this is the way it works. And the data has now been added. So let's double check. There's supposed to be 16 tables and 1,000 rows in the film database. Just to be doubly sure, even though I already connected as this, I'm going to disconnect and connect again. Just like to double check that everything works. So after creating the schema and adding the data, I logged out of SQL Plus. I'm just gonna log back in just to show that everything's working properly. We log back in and we wanted to find out how many tables were created. Or we just look at the or the table names, table. And we see there were 16 tables created. And that's what we expected to see. And let's do a count star from film. There should be 1,000 films. Uh, S-E-L-E-C-T, count star from film. Got it. So this means we've set up our example database correctly. And we figured out the connection string for SQL Plus to actually access that data. And the next thing I like to do is connect with two more utilities. Well, one is the Deep Beaver uh, Community Edition, which is a beautiful SQL IDE. If you're doing a lot of work in SQL, this is very, very handy. I haven't seen anything better than this as a SQL IDE. And then we're also going to connect um, with Python code using the CX Oracle implementation of Python's DB API. And all we're doing in both of these cases, as with SQL Plus, is showing what that connection string is because that is often the hardest thing to figure out. And once you've got, you're connected to the database, you can do anything you need to from there. So let's go ahead and install dbeaver-ce. And uh, this is what the website looks like. I'm going to go ahead and download it. Community Edition, Windows, 
64-bit installer. Save the file. That's finished downloading. Go ahead and run it. English, next to continue. We're gonna scroll down to the bottom and accept. And we'll set it for all users, why not? Actually, let's just set it for myself. And associate.sql files with dbeaver. Sounds like a good idea. Put it in the default location and install it. The installation is finished. Let's go ahead and create a desktop shortcut. And let's show how to connect. With a uh, eBeaver. Bring up the community edition as by double clicking on the icon, of course. Allow access from the Windows firewall. Uh, we're not going to create any sample databases. I just did. So what are we going to use to connect to? We're looking, of course, for Oracle. And this is it right here. So we're going to set up our Oracle connection. It's off of local horse, host. We're going to set this, the service name as we did previously, which is Oracle pdb domain. Username that we're using is S-A-K-I-L-A. -A. Password is the same. And we can hit finish, but I'm pretty sure we're going to have to fill in the client there. Let's try this, though. It will automatically download the necessary drivers, so we'll just accept that. And that was it. We didn't have to specify anything. We're, we're logged on. Look at the schema. And uh, we can right click on that. Oh, we don't really need to go into this any further, actually, except that we like to run a query. So let's just bring up our SQL editor. And we can configure this any way we want to. Right now, we just brought it up. It hasn't been configured at all, but there's nice things we can do, select um, count star from film and uh, control return will execute that and we see we have a thousand remote rows. So we successfully downloaded the drivers because dbeaver did that for us, the JDBC drivers, because that's how dbeaver connects with, is with a JDBC connection and we set up the actual connection itself. We can double check that. If I right click on this, I can edit the connection and just see again what we set up. The user, the password, the service name, which was key. 1521 was mapped from our container to the local host, and so the host is local host. And that's all that was necessary to log in with dbeaver. This is a great tool. I highly recommend it if you're gonna be doing much SQL development. Next thing we wanna look at is Python. Let's create the simplest Python code to connect to the Oracle database using CX Oracle. So this is the simplest, or one of the simplest. We're gonna connect, we're gonna import the module that implements the DB API for Oracle. We're gonna connect username, password, the service uh, string, Coding is UTF-8, we'll get a cursor, execute, select star from film, just look at the first five rows and print them and close. And that is all we've got. Now the first thing to note, of course, is I don't have CX Oracle. I have to import, I have to do a pip install, or because I'm using Conda, it would be a Conda install. Now I can left click here, and I've already created uh, several environments. Let's click on this one. Now BS Code recognizes we're in my Conda environment, and we can double check that by creating a new terminal, 
and we see that it automatically activates my PY38 Conda environment. And of course that stands for Python 3.8. Verifying that. And now in this environment, we still don't have CX Oracle. Um, so it would be either pip install if you were using a Python virtual environment, but since I'm using a Conda virtual environment, it's Conda install. And of course, CX Oracle. And we're gonna go ahead and accept that. And we're done. This may need to be refreshed to know that we've got this. Let's, um, let's close that down and bring it back up. Well, I guess it cached the fact that that was missing when we brought when we started up VS Code, and it doesn't know that we just added it. That's fine. I'm sure if I bring bring this down, why wouldn't we just actually close VS Code and bring it back up again? Now it shows that it, that it can find the value, and it. Uh, this, let's accept yes for the recommendation there. It puts us in the right environment. The last one that we had, Pi38, CX Oracle. Now I'm going to create another video that talks about CX Oracle and how to use it. This just shows you how to connect because connecting, again, it can be difficult. And let's go ahead and run this. So I modified this code slightly say select title from film so we can just see that this is working without the other fields that we don't have a description for or understand just yet and we get five movies so it worked we could have, of course we could um order by title descending and we should get a different set of five we get the last five so that shows that we have in fact connected to the database. And again, I'll have another video that shows how to use the DB API with CX Oracle, and also another video that shows how to do it with Postgres. But for now, the main thing to note is how to connect to the Oracle database container that's running. And that's the end of this video.